What's up everyone? Welcome to another episode of Real Estate Moguls. My name is Grant Finley Shears and today we got James Dwiggins, the Chief Executive Officer of Next Home Inc. Um, who has been in the franchise business since 2006 and he's got a background in development. So I'm really excited to talk to him because we're gonna talk about technology and the problems with brokerages as well as with um, MLS and associations. And he's been known as, he's been called the futurist by Riz Media in 2018. Congratulations, that's pretty cool. And ranked number 72 on the most powerful leaders on Swan Pools Power 200. Really great publication, so that is a super uh, a great feat. So congratulations. Pleasure for being on the show. Absolutely. Um, so why don't we just start with, give a, you know, a couple minute overview, who you are and, and how did you get to where you are today? Yeah, so um, I was born into a real estate family, which you know I'm fortunate to understand the background of it. So 38 years of my life, I heard the word escrow from the day I was born. Um, so I've understood the industry because I've lived you know, in a real estate family. And early on in my career, I got involved in the tech sector because that's kind of where I was most excited about it. And we, back in 1998, we had worked with a company called Be Here Technologies out of Silicon Valley, and they had created the first dome camera that would do 360 virtual tours. So at the time, there was us, there was iPix, and a company called Bamboo.com. And we created this company called USA Virtual Tours, and we created a national network of photographers, and we you know, invested in these cameras and put them out all over the United States and created this network of companies that would, for, would film these 360 degree tours in homes. So that's where I got my background in tech. And then we sold that off. My partner and I um, started a new company called Vrio, and we had created the first automated website system. So think WordPress back only in 2001. Um, so templated system that would auto build, you know, a thousand real estate sites for a company at a, at a time, and then it would switch between templates and re-architect the site. So we were doing things quite far in advance from where technology is today. Yeah. We uh, found a company that we were interested in that was trying to create biometric signature software on tablet PCs. And so that was when Microsoft was really starting to get into the game of you know, tablets and signing stuff on, on computers. And so we created something called the Red Tablet, which, was, which stood for Real Estate Dashboard. And it was a way for um, realtors to upload their contracts, sit with the client, take the pen out, and sign the actual contract digitally. And then we used a PCMCI slot um, air card through Verizon or Sprint at the time and it would sync up to the web, push all the documents up to what's called cloud, and, uh, and that's how we were able to both sign documents electronically, fax them, and email them directly from the field. So we were doing some pretty advanced far things. Advanced. Yeah, yeah, and, al and honestly, too far ahead of our time. So, um, you know, the iPad wasn't even out yet. And that's a common thing for startups sure. sometimes, especially in the tech world, yeah. um, is how do you, like in hindsight, did you, did you know you were too ahead of your time and was that a worry for you or did you think it was going to get adopted really quickly and that was a, in hindsight like I think we were too ahead of our time? Well, so in our case, we didn't think we were ahead of our time because we thought that the real estate industry would adopt tablet PCs faster than they did. So we had partnerships with IBM, we had partnerships, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the company that we used to work with out of, it, was, it actually got bought by Dell, but we were trying to push the computers with the software. And so we worked with the manufacturer to buy the machine and our software came on it. The problem is tablet PCs were $3,000. There's this misperception in our industry. Startups think there's a lot of money in real estate and that's a, a big thing they don't understand. And so I've, I've been in this business a long time. We interview hundreds of companies a year that want to work with our firm. And nine times out of 10, investors and startups think that, oh, there's a million realtors or 1.2 million realtors and we're going to charge them all $40 a month and we're going to be billionaires and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, you guys are so far off the mark. The thing to understand about that, to kind of bring it back, 20% of agents do about 80% of the business. So you really have to look at it from, you only have a 20% market capture. If you get 40, great, but your price point has to be very affordable. If you look at Zillow, they started in 2005. You know, here we are in 2019, and they have maybe 30 to 40 percent of the market that's using their products with massive amounts of money thrown at it. So startups make a mistake in thinking that there's this big market, and there just yeah. isn't. Real estate brokerages, honestly, are they, they don't make as much money as people think. There's a lot of overhead. There's insurance costs, all this stuff that goes with it. So 
you know, for us at the time, we made the same mistake most startups in this industry make in thinking that, oh, it's a $3,000 machine, it'll save them all this time and money and blah, blah, blah. And yeah. so it took us two years and we, I think we only maybe sold 10,000 computers over the course of a two year period, you know, and getting, okay. you can't yeah. scale to a massive number if you're hitting that kind of yeah. market share. So, you know, if the iPad, if we had waited, we didn't know, but yeah. you know, like if yeah. we had maybe waited four or five years, when did we sell that company? We sold that company in 2006, and mm -hmm. iPad came out shortly thereafter, so you know, we were just... <laughs> Too early. Yeah, I mean, and, and then obviously the App Store came out, and who knows whether we could yeah, have sold yeah, our yeah. software for what yeah. anyway, but you know. Um, so let's continue on the thread for a bit. Um, when you think about the companies you know, that come to you and they want to work with your brokerage, yeah. um, you having been on the other side, yeah. what advice do you have for startups to say, if you want to work with a brokerage, here are some things, how to, how to speak their language, how to start that relationship, what, what kind of expectations do they have for the deal structure and how it's going to work and how it's going to roll out? Yeah. Um, what are, like, describe yes. you know, and give advice. So, so there's, there's kind of three layers in the real estate sector. There's the agent, there's the brokerage, and then there's the franchise, right? And so we're a franchise, we're the third layer on top. So you, you can sell to three different targets. The individual agent, which is a giant pain, um, or the brokerage, which you know, people think, oh, we'll just go to the broker and they'll buy it for all of their, their agents, which is possible. Um, and then there's the franchise, which makes even less money. So it's a, it's a percentage up. Agent makes the most, brokerage makes a little less, franchise makes a little less than that. So if you're thinking about how to approach it, the, the problem with approaching agents is that you are going to have to sell to individual agents. They're independent contractors, they have their own expenses, they pay their own health care, like everything is all independent. So their costs are much higher to run their business as an independent contractor than people think. Agents are also used to paying $10 here, $20 there, $40 there, etc. So this stuff adds up very quickly. Um, when companies come to, to us with a price point, they're, they're usually in this, like, we're going to sell it for, you know, $40 a month. And I'm like, for, for, okay, what is it and really how much value does it provide? Oh, it's this great little widget that does whatever. Good luck, you'll be gone in 12 months. Like, it's just not going to happen. Um, if the price point is lower, you're going to help get that adoption, obviously, but it just, I always tell people, if you're trying to sell something on a per seat license, like a SaaS model, and you're above 20 bucks a month, you have got to have the greatest thing ever if you want to get 10, 20, 30, 40,000 people to use it. Um, the brokerage is an easier way to go because you're not usually having to deal with trying to collect credit card payments from 40,000 people whose cards decline and don't return your phone calls and never answer emails and Right, so people go, oh, well, let's sell to the brokerage, but then you can bring that price point down in half, and if you come up to a franchise, you can bring it down even half further. So, like, franchises, we don't pay retail $25 a month, we'll pay five. Yeah. That's just how it works. Yeah, so, and I think that's where startups go wrong, is they get investment, or they sell investors on this idea of this mass audience. Investors see this huge amount of money, because in, in the United States, real estate commissions are about $62 billion a year. It's a massive amount of money, which is why there's so much investment coming into it but you're spreading that out over several million realtors and brokerages and franchises and it, it, it moves out fairly quickly. So it, it's not as easy as people think. Um, and it needs to be something that really is gonna change an agent's life in order for them to want to spend the money to do it. Um, agents are slow to adopt. This is the problem we all deal with on a daily basis is how do we get our agents to adopt the things that we're pushing out. They're busy, they're answering phone calls, they're dealing with inspections, they're, they're hair, their hair is on fire, and the last thing they care about is some little widget that's gonna make them an extra deal, right? So it's, I think that's where startups really struggle with understanding our industry, and that's why most wash out. Okay. It's not an easy business. So say, so say they do have a good product and they can get a good price yeah. point, or they understand yeah. how, how to get it sold. Talk about, um, Again, you know, what, how would you like a, a startup to approach you in terms of how, how does that relationship and that sales process yeah. look like? So we, we're, so most, so it's funny. Over the past ten years, the mindset has shifted. Thank God. Um, real estate companies usually have pretty big egos, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, we're too cool for you to take a meeting with us. That's that mindset has shifted, and. 
you know, a lot of a lot of partners, we call them partners in our company, were really treated poorly over a long period of time. We don't look at it that way. We look at everything as a partnership. So we tell people just to reach out. We have a, a chief strategy officer who reviews every product. It doesn't matter who you are, send it to us. We'll take a look at it and see if it fits in our, you know, development queue or if it's something unique that would, you know, fit our strategy of where we're going. And if so, we take a meeting and we talk. The things I'll tell most companies if your product is not you know, open, where we can push data in and out and control you know, the profile and pass you data and send you information and have you lock things down, white label it, et cetera, it'll never work. That is absolutely where the whole industry is moving. If your product can't be white labeled and you can't move data in and out through APIs easily and it can't be done through SSO, you'll never work in this industry because every major company is moving in that direction right now. And we've been doing this for, since our inception, so it's not like anything new for us. Um, so that's like an important piece of it. And then understanding if you're an MLS related product, I'm sure we'll talk about that, that's a whole other problem. So MLSs are really a nightmare in our industry and I'm pretty vocal about it. There's over 600 of them, there needs to be 50 total, there's no reason for it. The only reason MLSs exist on the scale they do is due to politics and job security. There's no other possible logical answer to it. Um, and it's, it's the fact that people don't want to consolidate. Agents are scared of the fact that when an MLS moves into their market or they merge, all of a sudden all the agents over there are going to sell business over here, which is complete utter nonsense because if it was that important, they would just pay the MLS fee and do business in that market. Yeah. So it's just a fear concept. But the point I'm making is right now there's still 600 of them. So if your product requires MLS data, that is going to be a nightmare. And it will not be an easy process, and it will take you years to get adoption across all those MLSs because some of them have committees, which means a lot of times it's somebody elected to the position by their peers who might have absolutely no basis or um, actual reason for being on that committee other than they thought it would be fun to do, yeah. making decisions about products for the rest of the membership. So products can be declined all the time, even though a broker might want the product, but the committee goes, no, we're not giving, the M we're not giving that company the MLS data. And so it's like, for example, you look at a couple of major companies that do CMAs, right? So MoxieWorks or Cloud CMA, they still only have half of the MLSs in the country and they've been around for like 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it's a big, big problem. Um, companies come in and they find that getting the MLS access is really difficult and that can just kill your investment. You burn through your cash faster than you thought you would and... It's expensive too, like it's, uh, I talked to this one, um owner of a tech company, he, he actually has now got, I think, all of them, or almost all of them, $1.2 million a year in fees. Yeah, to get, for no reason. To get all that data. Um, and I kind of get it, like they're a business. Like this is, uh, anyways, we'll, we'll maybe go in there. This is a really great sure. like, insight to yeah. this tech startup. So, so now I, I'm kind of seeing this, let's segue into when you, as the franchise, and you think about the technologies and the companies that are exciting to you, that are going to be solving problems for you now or in the future, yeah. that you're really excited about learning about or, or, or getting or having a company finally figure out um, what kind of excites you and, and why. Yeah. So the way that I see the future of tech right now is, I'll kind of segue this two ways. The, the biggest problem our industry faces today is we have a lot of companies coming in to try and grab a piece of that $62 billion, which is great. I love innovation and anything that pushes our industry forward, I'm a fan for, right? Even if it's something that's not good for my business, I still think it causes us to think, right? So what we're looking at as a company and what most are looking at is how to increase the value proposition of the agent. It's not like we haven't been doing that, but that definition is different today than it was even a few years ago. Um, automation is an enormous part of that. It, the, the problem with our business is that agents are independent contractors. You can't really tell them what to do. So, you know, the experience from two different agents at the same company can be night and day, which is a big problem. And giving them a product doesn't mean they're going to adopt the product. So the more that we can figure out ways to automate what an agent should be doing and making it as easy as possible for that to happen, that product is going to be something companies are going to look at pretty aggressively. Um, as an example, we rolled out a product um, last year where we take MLS data and we send it into this, this company. 
and it builds all of the marketing pieces, it builds all of the brochures, the social media pieces, and it emails it right back to our agents. So instead of the agent having to create all of this stuff, now it's being created for them. There's no reason not to just click print, you know, which is hooked into a printer to professionally print. You see what I'm saying? So that, those things I think is where companies are, are looking aggressively. AI obviously is something that is part of that. How do we, how do we make things happen without a thought process you know, by the agent having to be part of that. Now, when you do all this automation, you are helping an agent produce more efficiently. Correct, yeah, or, or increase their value proposition. Yeah. Well, I mean, so it's more seamless and efficient in the transaction process with that end consumer, which on the one hand bodes for the argument of, hey, this opens up the door for commissions to go down because you guys are able to produce more because you have all this automation, you have all this technology. What about Say, so look at that in reverse, though. And, and, and so what about the other side where it's like, hey, how can technology um, help make the yeah. homeowner and, the, and, and the, the seller and the buyer yeah. go, you're worth way more, you know, yeah. you're providing more value for that. Yeah, so, so example automation would be, we're, we're at a point where single property websites, why they're not just a standard thing that every single home in America has is beyond me. Like, it's, we, we mass produce them now, so it's something that's just automatically done. And... To me, that's, that's something an agent had to pay for before, which is there, therein lies the problem. Do I spend that money or not based upon my costs, my expenses, et cetera? For us, we look at it like we're giving the homeowner now all of the things they should be receiving to increase that value proposition. So yes, while we're automating some of it, it's, it's not like it's not being paid for though. The agent's still paying the company for these things and we're pushing that back out. So the homeowner's getting a better marketing product which hopefully will sell the house for more money, right? So more exposure, you know, more advertising, all of that increases, you know, the chance that we're gonna get a higher offer on a property, so. Now you did the virtual reality, or virtual tours. Um, what are your thoughts on, on open houses? Are they just gonna go down and down and down in terms of, um, you know, visibility and, and, and execution and people are just going to start doing just more 3D virtual tours and, and, and do less and, and really just have private appointments for to go check out a house like they got to see it most people would still want to go walk yeah, I mean, in are you going to buy a house without it? touching a property like, but then but then can they all be private showings so that it's not as like inconvenient for yeah else? well that's inconvenient for the homeowner so in my opinion, you could use Matterport or any of these you know, virtual tours to, well, 3D tours, to go through and see a property and determine whether it makes any sense. What's great about products like Matterport, for example, is you can get into the property a little bit better, see it walk through it, but you also get a floor plan. I mean, why we don't have a floor plan on every home that's being sold is beyond me. Like, it just, this is the kind of stuff that drives me nuts because what person doesn't want to know, is my furniture going to fit? How's the layout of the property? So those things I think will decrease, you know, people walking through the home, which is convenient, by the way, for the seller, because nobody wants to have more people walking through the property than they need to. So I'm not, I'm not sure it's going to get rid of open houses. I think it might reduce the number of people going through it, but at the same time, the people coming through might be a better quality customer to work with. So from the agent's perspective, I'd rather have five people come through that I know are very interested in the home than a bunch of looky-loos walking through and, you know, have no interest in doing anything. The reverse side of that is there might be an interested buyer in another property, but this is what this is what the, the future is going to look like anyway. It, it's interesting because one of the things I'm really focused on as a company is this iBuyer conversation. And I was listening to a speaker yesterday who's testing this, and we're looking at it like most major brokerages are. Um, and, and he was talking about convenience. The biggest thing they're hearing is the seller wants convenience, not this drawn out process and all these people and repairs and everything else. Again, this is a small segment. I'm not saying it's a major segment of the market, but I found it fascinating that the people he's talking to were willing to take less of, a, of the sales price to take a reduction in order to have convenience of just getting out of the property. So, you know, the 3D tours provide more convenience for the seller. I think there's an opportunity to use that as a way to explain this is what we do as a traditional sale that will net you more money. And I know convenience is a problem for you and having to walk out all the time, but now because we're doing this 3D tour, we can reduce the number of showings down and reduce people that are bothering you and, and make it more focused on actual buyers have interest in the property. So I think tech can have an interesting play on it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about this MLS, like the challenges that you or the franchise have with the MLS, and you talked about they need to consolidate, it needs to be one. 
Are there any not one? Or no, sorry, fifty. One per state. Yeah. Um, are there any um, solutions that you're seeing that's happening, or any technologies that you think that actually will help make that happen? No. And so, I mean, when people, sure. talk, when people talk about the dis, the, the, the there's tech out there to do it. The elimination of them, like I mean, it's not a technology are, issue. There's nothing to do with technology. A organizational. Issue. Oh, it's just bureaucracy. That's all it is. There's, yeah. there's not any. There's no logical conversation whatsoever about the tech. It's all there. We aggregate 165 MLSs in my company. 165 of them, of which there's still no standards, even though we're working with Rezo and others. But it's just, it's a mess, right? And it's not that hard for us to do. It just isn't. And so the, the tech conversation is irrelevant in my mind. So it's bureaucracy. It's, it's the fact that an association, most associations get their revenue by making people be part of the association, have access to the MLS, maybe not most, I don't know the exact number, but it's somewhere around there. And it's a revenue source. And it goes to, you know, what is the value proposition of associations? Yeah. You know, and that's a big question that everyone's asking. And the MLS is, there's people there. I mean, I get it. There's executives and teams. And then there's the idea that people want their own boundary in their market is to keep everybody else out. But that's, yeah. that's that f position of fear. Yeah. Um, in our industry for the longest time, I had this conversation yesterday and just blew my mind that you know, there, that people believe that the value of a realtor back in the day, I remember these days because I was in a real estate family of the MLS book before any database yeah, existed, okay, right? Yeah. And yeah, realtors used that. And they, they grabbed onto that because if you want to know what home was for sale, you had to talk to a realtor. I get it, but that was never the value proposition. That's just information. Somebody has to negotiate it, show the properties, and work through all the pain points, et cetera. And the truth is data, you know, I'll get skewed for this, but it's just, I, I, don't, I don't think it has any value. Like the, the data itself, of, of, it's not even really, in my opinion, the broker's data, it's the actual homeowner's data. Yeah. It's their property. They're using your services to sell it. Now, I get that when you do photos, it's intellectual property and things like that, but the reality is it's still my home. Yeah. And if our value proposition is around that data, then we are completely, we might as well just close shop. Yeah. So. Associations are having this problem because they're trying to find value with it. MLSs are like, oh, we don't want to consolidate because people have to lose jobs. I get it. But the problem is brokerages, franchises, agents, and tech companies pay a fortune in order to provide great technology because they can't get access to the data because it's $1.2 million a year in fees or whatever it might be. It's expensive. So, you know, in a perfect world, I really do believe associations are not going to have as much relevance. I think they have extreme relevance when it comes to lobbying um, and dealing with influencing politicians to make sure they don't make bad decisions, which they inherently do, at least in this country. So, um, you know, that, that is a core thing. I mean, if you look at the dues dollars that get spent, I believe almost half of it at NARA goes to advocacy, political advocacy. So it, are we about our code of ethics, or is it which nobody even knows what they are, and the consumer doesn't really honestly care? Or is it more about the fact that we're making sure there's great housing policy locally at the state level and at the federal level? And I think those are, these are questions that have to be answered. Um, I do believe associations have value in providing training and things for the agents, but does it need to be one at every local level? Probably not. You know, like MLSs, maybe a statewide, you know, that has dues go down to local areas to help with some of the political influence. Um, but we're in for some big changes. There, I, I, have, I do not see a future in this industry where the 1.2 million realtors is down to five, 600,000 eventually, uh, which I think would be a great thing for our industry anyway. It'll, it'll help kind of weed out people that really don't know what they're doing or they don't have enough time to educate themselves on the process. And it, it'll make the industry overall better and we'll have a better impression because, you know, overall realtors don't get the best, yeah. you know, people don't look at them in the most positive well, so light. So in, in, if you were trying to sum up in one sentence, because I know I have a, a way of summing this up, what technology, and, and it's so funny, like the book, where you talk about, you know, what realtors thought their job was yeah. when the book was around, yeah. was giving housing data. Yeah. And then now that it's online, okay, they're realizing that's not really it. Now they're thinking about it as, the data or about valuing homes and all that stuff, but yeah. technology is going to actually start taking some of those jobs away yeah. from them. So at the core, what do you think a realtor's business really is? Yeah. What are they really in the business of? It's a great question. Um, and I can tell you, I share with you what we're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So, and we're being more public about this. We're shifting the job of what, you know, a real estate agent 
is today. Um, if, it, if, if, we are, if we are four years from now about this small window of time where we, a buyer comes to us and then we help them find a property and, and get them into the property, which by the way, I'm not undermining how complex that is. If people think that buying a house online and just doing the process that way is going to be automated, you've never either bought a home or you don't understand the complexities or the realtor is not doing a good enough job of articulating to that buyer or seller what they do for a living, right? I use this example when I do a lot of um, public speaking. I go, well, I get a bill every month from my attorneys, and I have a lot of them, unfortunately, but I forget all the things that we did over the course of the month because I'm busy. I'm yeah. on planes. I'm whatever, right? Yeah. And, and at the end of the month, I get a bill, and there's this giant bill, and, and it, it explains to me everything that happened for that godforsaken amount of money that I have to spend, right? Yeah. Yeah. But it reminds me of what it is. Well, realtors don't do that. We, we shelter people from it all, so when they see this $10,000 commission check they're giving out, they're going, oh my God, what did I get? So my point is, I, I, where, I, where I see tech and the industry changing is, I, I think if, if we start focusing the agent from not just being this small window of time where they're helping somebody buy or sell a property, but becoming more of this advocacy for home ownership or the homeowner over the course of seven to 10 years that they own that home, where everything that is related to that property is being uh, brought to them by that real estate agent. Then we start to change the relationship, we start to change the value proposition, like a financial advisor to some degree. Where tech comes into that is we have so much access to data now that we didn't have access to five years ago, and nothing ten years ago except MLS data, that we now have the ability to give realtors a talking point that will allow them to remain relevant. And I'll, I'll sum it up with this one stat. So 82% of sellers say that they would use their same agent again, yet only 27% of them actually do. Right? That's a bad stat. That's a really bad stat. And the reason is that when the agent's done with the transaction, they don't really have anything to talk to the consumer about. And tech about. companies, all they think about is lifetime value. Right. So there's a marriage coming, yeah. I think, down the road. And we're working pretty aggressively on this in our firm to, to create this change of role. We've been, we've been on this project now for, for two years, aggregating a lot of different data to start changing the relationship. So I think that's where AI, I think that's where tech, and I think that's where a human being involved in the process will merge into changing the position of what they do, what they're perceived as, increasing that value proposition, which I believe will reduce the downward pressure on commissions and, and make them relevant in the future. So, exactly. Yeah. Great way to end it. Uh, how can people get in touch with you if they want to reach out? And oh, just email anymore? james at uh, nexthome.com. Cool. So, yeah. Well, thanks so much Absolutely. for being on the show. Appreciate it. Uh, as always, if you haven't already, subscribe so you can learn from more real estate moguls like James. This is a great show, and thanks for all your insight. Absolutely.